You're listening to ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to Heart Matters, where leading cardiology experts explore the latest trends, technologies, and clinical developments in cardiology practice. Your host for Heart Matters is Dr. Janet Wright, Senior Vice President for Science and Quality for the American College of Cardiology. The right tests for the right patient at the right time. We're seeing some progress in cardiac imaging toward this lofty goal, thanks in part to a system that combines online technology with science-based selection criteria. This system will help clinicians track their patterns of care, provide insights into variations in care across the country, and ensure that patients get the test that brings the most value to their care. Our guest today is Dr. Robert Hendel, clinical cardiologist and Midwest heart specialist based in the Chicago suburbs. Dr. Hendel is also a professor of medicine at Rush University Medical College in Chicago and past president of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. Welcome, Bob. Thank you very much, Dr. Wright. I understand that work is apace now in multimodality imaging. Yes, that's correct. certainly hasn't stopped, and the development of these criteria are sort of continuing and expanding. We're now on the second go-round looking to revise existing criteria for myocardial perfusion imaging and cardiac CT, and I think an extremely broad and worthwhile initiative, the American College of Cardiology is working with the American College of Radiology in the development of multimodality imaging criteria. And this is going to be a very complex process, and it's taking components of both the way the ACR and the ACC approach appropriateness criteria development and are coming up with a hybrid that's very, very well thought out and hopefully will be sort of the the key documents in how we use medical imaging for cardiac testing. This study looked at six practice sites, I believe, imaging practices, and looked at over 6,300 patients. Talk to us about the design of the study. This was a study that really came out of the idea that it wasn't enough just to build appropriate use criteria and develop them and then publish them and say, please use them. It really came out of a need to say, how can we use them? And is it really something feasible that we can measure? Is this something that we can say a group or a practice or an individual is performing appropriate utilization of of a particular test or procedure? So that was basically the construct by which the pilot was developed. The American College of Cardiology partnered with an insurance company, in this case United Healthcare, to develop the approach and, as you mentioned, selected six sites across the country in varying sizes. And the basic goal was to say, in the real world, can appropriateness be measured? In other words, can appropriate information be collected and then have an automated determination of which indication the patient was actually being given a test for and to make a determination of appropriateness, whether it be appropriate test, inappropriate test, or uncertain indication? And Bob, you selected SPECT MPI imaging as the technology to be studied. Tell us why. Largely because these criteria had been around the longest, people had become familiar with them, was a relatively succinct group of patients that were coming in with known or suspected coronary disease, and it was also a very high-focused area in terms of reimbursement, in terms of the concern about overuse. So therefore, we felt this was a really good area to start with and something that hopefully could be done. It was an interesting development. We developed an intake form, which is roughly one page, which we figured would take approximately one or two minutes for a practice site to complete at the time that the patient presented for testing. The famous one-minute rule in terms of filling out an additional form. Exactly. We're trying to keep physician and staff work down to a bare minimum, but while still collecting key information, and that was the one-minute rule. And this was then integrated into a web-based data entry system that each site was able to access. And once the information was in and the data was completed, each site could actually get a report of what the uh, test was, whether it was indicated or inappropriate, and also see how they're doing through time. So this study started a little bit over a year ago, and we've now collected almost a year's worth of data, and we've been able to follow temporal trends, and we've been able to see the impact of referrals in terms of whether or not they're within the practice or external to the practice and whether or not that dictates inappropriate rates. And finally, we've also been able to try to look to see if education of the physicians and staff has an impact on inappropriate utilization. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Heart Matters on ReachMD, XM160, the channel for medical professionals. I'm your host, Dr. Janet Wright. 
Our guest today is Dr. Bob Hendel, clinical cardiologist at Midwest Heart Specialist just outside Chicago. Dr. Hendel is also a professor of medicine at Rush University Medical College in Chicago and past president of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. We're discussing Dr. Hendel's SPAC pilot study, presented as a late-breaking clinical trial at the ACC's 58th annual scientific session in Orlando. So, Bob, part of the reason the study was conducted was to find out if studies can be judged to be appropriate, uncertain, or inappropriate in this sort of real-life setting. What did you find out? Clearly, that was probably the most important aspect. Is this feasible? Can we actually measure this and do it in a way that is not overly laborious to the individual sites that are actually doing this? And and we found out that most sites found this to be fairly benign in terms of actually going through the process and certainly a lot less onerous than a lot of prior notification or pre-certification programs, which require far more time and energy on the part of staff as well as physicians. And tell us about the results of the study. Well, the results of the study are still developing, but thus far we've been able to develop benchmarks of what we think are inappropriate testing levels. Overall, while there was variability across the six different practices, we see that it's all in the range of roughly 10 to 20 percent of all studies are deemed inappropriate, and this is as a baseline. And certainly some sites did a little bit better than others, and some sites actually got substantially better through time. But we were able to say that there was a finite amount of studies that were deemed inappropriate. I think most importantly, however, was of the inappropriate studies that were performed, there were really only two or three major indications that accounted for the vast majority of inappropriate studies. And once we started to see that pattern, we then started to give feedback to the sites and explain to them that these are the key problems, such as the asymptomatic low-risk patient. That's one of the areas that is deemed inappropriate and was very commonly found as an indication for testing. This is a wonderful opportunity then for quality improvement and education in real time. Absolutely. And real time, and we've also developed some educational instruments, but we believe that this is a really great target and a way that we can direct education to the practitioners as well as to the referring physicians about this is how a test can and should be used. And this is where we can really look to save some resources. And maybe this particular group of patients does not warrant testing at this point. And one of the hopeful findings here was some insight into variations in care. What did you discover? Well, there there are clearly variations in care, and that to us also says there's an opportunity, that the high-level performing sites with very low inappropriate rates, they're doing something a little bit different, and basically we need to get the message out to some of the other sites. And we have seen in particular one site demonstrated marked improvement through the course of the pilot where they continued to decrease their inappropriate utilization. And that says to me and to all of us that you know, we can learn, we can understand what we're doing and get better at it. It seems to me that one of the most valuable aspects to a participating practice is to gain insight into that practice's pattern of care. In my practice, we had no feedback. We had no idea. I was not aware at all of a practice pattern. Do you think that's a valuable component here? Oh, I think so. And and the feedback we're getting from the physicians, both within the practice as well as the primary care doctors that have heard about this through letters and other communications, really value the information. One of the key areas is we had a number of clinicians that simply were unaware that stress testing before low-risk surgery in a low-risk patient was just simply not needed. And by emphasizing that as being one of the inappropriate indications, we watched that figure drop substantially through time. And I, I think you're right that a lot of processes, including some of the current prior authorization programs do not allow us to get that feedback and that information. So built into this kind of program that we saw in the pilot is that continuous quality improvement aspect that I think is very important. Bob, did you learn anything in this pilot about the rates of inappropriate or appropriate ordering by folks within the practice itself or by those referring to that practice? Well, that's a very interesting question, Janet. And as you're well aware, certainly within the field of cardiology has come under great scrutiny about the concept of self-referral and how cardiologists continue to do more tests for not necessarily the best of reasons. And this was an area that we were 
extremely interested in. And the study does reveal that there's actually higher inappropriate rates from outside of the practice than from within, suggesting that self-referral is not the key motivator driving the process. And we also compared cardiologists versus primary care physicians. And again, we noticed a higher inappropriate utilization among the primary care physicians than the cardiologists. And what that says is, again, that we need to go beyond the spectrum of just cardiologists and branch out into the primary care arena, such as with OBGYN physicians, internal medicine, and family practitioners, to get the message of what we're learning about this in terms of test utilization. You know, with, with the explosion of choices of imaging technologies, this is a complex field. And I would think that most practitioners, particularly those who are not imaging for a living, would welcome this kind of guidance, particularly at the point of order. I think so. I think this is real-world information that's made usable and digestible. And you just pointed out sort of the next phase of, I think, where we all need to take this process and where hopefully the studies will move forward in the future, which is to move from a point-of-service kind of analysis where this was all collected and all the information gathered when the patient came to the laboratory to a point of ordering whereby the physician and staff who are ordering a particular procedure would carefully input key parameters and then get a designation right up front about whether or not that test was or was not appropriate. That doesn't mean it couldn't or shouldn't be performed, but at least it would give them some idea of where it was and in a way to sort of have education in real time about their ordering practices. It seems an aspect of professionalism. Absolutely. And I think as we move forward with electronic health records and physician's order entry systems, it would only be natural to incorporate tools such as this directly into that process. And certainly our electronic abilities and software development really mesh very nicely into this whole paradigm. Bob, you implied earlier that the practices you worked with gave you a lot of positive feedback. Maybe you could expand on that a little bit and then tell us the reaction of the payer partner, United. Well, from the practice level, first of all, we were surprised that there wasn't more complaining about the fact that they were going forward and having to do a little bit extra work. They all saw the potential value, first of all, in terms of education and providing best practice, which I think is something that really, I think, opened a lot of eyes. They said, we can improve and that, gee, this is really interesting. I just never knew these patterns existed before. I think that was one of the key things. And then as they continued to get feedback and reports, they were intrigued and physicians being the competitive souls that we all are, were trying to outdo the competition. And they saw site number two was doing a little better, so they wanted to continue to improve. And I think that's the whole basis of what all of us have always attempted in quality assurance and quality improvement to continue the process. And I think just even participating, even without those reports, automatically raised the bar from the practice level. With regards to our partner here, which was United Healthcare, I think they're completely fascinated by this. There's been a lot of things that have gone on in the past year or so since the study was initiated. One very important aspect is that United, along with many other health plans, have adopted a program using radiology benefits managers and prior notification. And they did so out of a need in terms of what they felt their field was doing and that their competition was all moving in that direction. But they've been very carefully tracking what's happening with the pilot as an alternative to the use of radiology benefits managers. It is sort of a benefits manager, but in a different context with feedback and education built in. And that keeps the patient-physician relationship intact, the appropriate use criteria. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of relationships that are kept intact. First of all, it preserves patient access to testing because the tests will still go forward and what we're doing is collecting patterns of utilization and looking at them and getting a lot more information than just a yes-no, which is basically how many RBMs function. But I think it's also improved the relationship among the entire healthcare community, that being the payer community, professional societies, physicians, and patients, all of which recognize this problem of expense and healthcare expenditures, but all want to do the right thing in terms of taking good care of our patients and preserving access to the needed studies and procedures that must go forward. So I think everything is sort of harmonized very nicely through this process, and we look forward to this kind of a relationship not only with United, but hopefully other health health plans and and CMS in the future. We've been talking with Dr. Robert Hendel about the real-world application of appropriate use criteria for imaging. 
Dr. Hendel, thank you for being our guest today. My pleasure, Janet. You've been listening to Heart Matters on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. For more information on this week's show or to download a podcast of this segment, please visit us at ReachMD.com. Thank you for listening.